Hi, everyone. Before we get into the episode, I wanted to take a moment to address the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. This decision stripped away the right to have a safe and legal abortion. Abortion is a basic health care need for the millions of people who become pregnant. Everyone should have the freedom to decide what's best for themselves and their families, including when it comes to ending a pregnancy. This decision has dire consequences for individual health and safety and could have harsh repercussions for other landmark decisions. Restricting access to comprehensive reproductive care, including abortion, threatens the health and independence of all Americans. Even if you live in a state where abortion rights are upheld, access to safe medical abortions shouldn't be determined by location, and it shouldn't be the privilege of a small few. You can help by donating to local abortion funds. To find out where to donate for each state, visit donationsforabortions.com. That's the number four. If you or someone you know needs help, or if you want to get more involved, here are five resources. One, Shout Your Abortion is a campaign to normalize abortion. Two, Don't Ban Equality is a campaign for companies to stand against abortion restrictions. Three, Abortion.cafe has information about where to find clinics. Four, PlanCPills.org provides early at-home abortion pills that you can keep in your medicine cabinet. And five, Choice.crd.co has a collection of these resources and more. I encourage you to speak up. Take care and spread the word. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. another episode of the reality is as always it's newer i'm uh hi can i just say before we get started that i'm really excited to be here i'm very excited to be here talking to you in your ear <laughs> and i just i just wanted to say thank you um to everybody who listens because i do think that this podcast has really really smart listeners and really thoughtful people who interact. And um, I shared something really difficult in the real uh, last episode where I talked about my eating disorder with the Housewives of Beverly Hills. And I really appreciate everybody who reached out and shared their kind feelings and thoughts. And um, as a person who grew up not getting a ton of Sorry if there's all this noise. I'm like shifting around my mic because, guys, fun fact, I I hurt my back sleeping. Isn't that fucking bullshit when, like, you do the one thing you're supposed to do to, like, reset your body and then your body's like, fuck you. (laughs) I'm going to hurt. So I'm just moving my mic around. But I was saying, um, I, as a person who never grew up uh, really getting a lot of compliments and a person who grew up with a lot of self-doubt, Um, I have a very difficult time accepting compliments or accepting kind words. And um, my my whole body wants to crawl inside of itself when anybody says anything nice to me, which is ironic because I also am begging for attention (laughs) all the time. But Anybody who did reach out, I just want to say I really appreciate you. I'm I'm so grateful. I am um I'm uncomfortable because I don't get it. I am uncomfortable because I grew up never getting it and it's still something that I need to get used to and I am working on it actively because I see my kids doing the same thing sometimes. They like freak out when I'm like nice to them. Uh, not the little one. He's a narcissist. He loves it. But the older one, he freaks out a little bit. So I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, continue the cycle. So I'm working on it. Um, but I appreciate you guys so much. I appreciate you for um for just being here. Uh it it honestly it means the world. Um, I hope that one day I don't get invited to somebody's car. Um, and then they play the greatest hits of all the times that I was offensive. 
<laughs> like they did to Heavenly on Married to Medicine. <laughs> Let's talk. Let's talk about what we're talking about today. We're talking about Real Housewives of Atlanta, and we're talking about Real Housewives of uh, not Real Housewives of Real Housewives of My Heart. Okay, the ladies of Married to Medicine. So I'm going to go ahead and start with Married to Medicine because it was such a ridiculous episode. The best thing about watching this lineup, and I've said it before, I'll say it again. I know I'm repeating myself, is the fact that I can watch these shows and just sit back and crack the fuck up. Okay. So much stuff happens over, like, like they're just wildly entertaining people. Like, I just want to be, I get why, like, Kari keeps showing her face every few episodes. Because, like, these seem, like, genuinely hilarious people to be around. Like, every time Kari shows up, they just, like, make fun of her. But I feel like I wouldn't mind being <laughs> made fun of in this group because they're just all so damn funny. So the episode starts with Quad and Simone having dinner and Quad is telling Simone about how her, her nephew Mason and how he's moved in. And Simone is telling um, Quad about Miles' girlfriend, Andrea, not to be confused with Andrea. <laughs> he wasn't there. Wasn't there a... And this is like maybe way... But, so when I moved to America, 90210 was like on the air and just wrapping up it was 95 so i think it had finished by then so i would only catch like reruns every now and then but my older cousins were like 90210 90210 kids what did i call it earlier did i call it 9021 i'm sorry beverly hills 90210 and so wasn't there an act wasn't there a character in there named andrea and then she had like a very unique real I don't know where my brain is right now, but that's what I'm thinking of. Is was her name Andrea or was it Andrea? I feel like she had a name in real life that had a special pronunciation, but on the show she was Andrea, or maybe it was the other way around. Either way, that scene cracked me up. Like they just watching these women talk just like makes me laugh. Um, Contessa visits Toya, and Toya is on a self-care journey, which Honestly, it sounds like my kind of self-care journey. Toya's self-care journey is traveling to Dubai, traveling all over the world, being in the Maldives, going going on vacation. And, you know, she's she's bought herself some flowers. She's putting them up in the house. <laughs> I I think um and I have to have my friend Kim back on the episode. Uh but she talked about talked to me over text about how like Toya essentially is is dissatisfied in the world. Okay, like she's, I I think that Toya's bored and I think she's miserable because this is why she keeps selling and buying houses. Like she literally has not had another storyline ever, um, except for this one. So, but now she's on this self care journey. This is the new thing that she's saying is that she's on a self care journey. But really, that self care journey is going to include building a brand new house big enough for a tennis court. <laughs> but anyway, um, Toy and Contessa are basically talking about their issues with Heavenly and her YouTube channel, and they plan an intervention. And, you know, Contessa's got herself a partner in crime. They call Simone, and Simone's like, yeah, let's do it. Um, They go to the next scene, which is Jackie at work. So, you know, as much as, like, Married to Medicine is always – you know, just ridiculous. And some of the fights are absurd. Like, you know, um, <laughs> I will not come up my chariot and throw tomatoes with you, darling is like a is like a it's like <laughs> it's Shakespeare. OK, like that's the kind of stuff that like cracks me up on Married to Medicine. But every season they have something else like actually useful. They, I feel like it's the one show on Bravo that actually uses their platform. Like besides I'd say like Project Runway and Top Chef, which always works to, you know, use its platform for something to like teach people something, educate people with something. Married to Medicine is another one of those shows that always does it. And so they had this scene where Jackie is talking to a patient and it's a black woman and she talks about the mortality rates, the astonishingly high mortality rates of um, black women specifically, but especially black mothers. And, um, there's actually a documentary that just came out, I think on Hulu and I'm going to post the name. I, I apologize. I can't remember the name. I think it's called the aftershock. Um, it's on Hulu and I'll put the name in the description of this episode, the actual name that I can't think of right now. Um, but somebody in my town actually had, uh, 
has a friend who was on that show because they lost their daughter um, during labor and delivery. And they, um, and this was like a, their, their daughter, their older daughter who was pregnant and giving birth and died. And so this woman is now advocating and working, especially with black women um, and, and ki- trying to work to make sure that advocacy for, uh, for black women is higher that people listen to black women and in healthcare. I mean, we know this now, um, it especially became really, really, um, it, it, it especially became a point of a discussion during black lives matter, because it was one of the things that was brought up by the movement of, you know, it's not just about police brutality is brutality in all forms, including not being heard by healthcare professionals. And that is especially something that black women in particular are often, um, are often uh, disproportionately subjected to. Um, anyway, um, so that that is something that I think is uh, really important, and I appreciate Mary to Medicine for bringing that up. So Jackie's talking about it, and she teaches her patient how to advocate for herself in labor and delivery room. And it's so amazing because – to some, sometimes Jackie pisses me off because, like, even in the beginning of this episode, there's this woman who's like a mid to small size person, and she's like, "Yeah, I'm thinking about wanting to have a baby." And Jackie's like, "Well, you know, weight is an issue." And I'm like, "This is a normal size woman, Jackie. Like, you need to chill out." And that stuff really bothers me when she does it, but. Most of the time, Jackie is really, really looking out for patients. And I mean, ultimately, I think that when a doctor says that they're cons- that weight is a factor, weight is a factor, many things are a factor in somebody's um, like overall health. But uh, with Jackie, most of the time, she has really, really good points. And this was a really great one. And she talked, you know, used her platform, used the time on camera to talk about something that was really important, which is how black women should advocate for themselves in the labor and delivery room. Uh, which I thought was great. Um, Anila, we we saw last week that her kid's nanny is leaving, Miss Gomez. And like, there's this whole scene of like her sitting the kids down and telling them that Miss Gomez is leaving. <laughs> and all her son cares about is his damn pinto beans. And of course, like her daughter, Ariana, has like a very emotional reaction and it's really sad and everything. But um, I... It was weird that, like, they were like, here's some grocery store flowers and, like, we'll let you keep the car seat. (laughs) I hope they wrote her a big-ass check or something. I hope they made it worth her while for, like, what? Like, this is, I don't know, something about it felt real, like, I don't, I, it felt, um, it felt phony. But, I mean, so much of what Anila does is phony to me. She drives me crazy. Um, Eugene and Toya are at home and he talks to Toya about sort of this like burnout feeling that he's been having, especially two year, being two years out of COVID and, you know, married to medicine, the season, I, I don't believe it was last season. Maybe it was, I can't remember, but they had the season where like right after COVID and I think it maybe was last season. And they, this is the only show that really showed like what life was like for, was what life was like for physicians that were in the, the you know, in the belly of the beast of COVID. And that was really interesting to see Eugene talk about it and say that he's thinking about taking a step back from his job and maybe using his time to make money elsewhere. And I think what Eugene is trying to say is he's trying to like find a hobby that could just make him happy. But Toya is kind of like, is it going to be a hobby that makes me money? Like, yeah, Eugene has a hobby that makes him money. It's called being on a Bravo TV show. Like, Toya, you get paid for this. Your whole family does. It's fine. Um, but I think what's interesting is Eugene's talking about sort of this burnout feeling that you get because in the in when it, the start of the pandemic, you know, physicians were going, going, going. And then afterwards, when things kind of started to settle down, they started to feel really burnt out. And I think that's such an interesting um, – I, it's such an interesting thing to point out because I think a lot of times people think that burnout is when um, is going to happen, you know, when you're in the in the thick of it. But burnout never does. It's because you overexert yourself when you're in the thick of it. And sometimes that feeling you get, like that depression you feel at the end with the burnout, can be um, a little bit of PTSD. That's how I was diagnosed with mine, and that is when uh, about a year. A uh, year and a half or so after my son's treatment, after my son's cancer diagnosis, 
I had this like horrible, horrible feeling where I was just like dead on the inside is the best way to describe it. Like the only feeling I had was like nothing or tears. And one of the things that my therapist told me was, you know, when you feel burnt out, sometimes it's just uh, feeling dead inside. Um, And then that overwhelming sadness that you're getting is the fact that you didn't process the trauma when it was happening. You're processing it now after the fact, and it is overwhelmingly sad. Um, And I know Eugene didn't really talk about that in particular, but it felt to me like maybe that's where he was kind of pointing to. He called it burnout, but I feel like there's also a lot of that, which is, you know, something that previously brought you so much joy, like your job, uh, could be making you so sad that you want to take a step away from it. That is definitely a part of uh, kind of that post-traumatic stress that you get from going through something really traumatic. So I just love that whenever I watch Married to Medicine, it like brings up these other very relatable real life issues that people have. Um, what's not relatable is being real life friends with Amorosa. <laughs> I was shocked. I mean, I wasn't that shocked because I did see the preview for it, but I was shocked to hear that someone and Cecil have been friends with Amorosa since way back when. And and I was glad that they said it because they kept being like, we want to be like Amorosa. And I was like, aren't there other people who have written books? But I guess what they're trying to say is like a person they know personally who's been on reality TV and use their platform to make money by writing a book, right? Like I think that that's really what they're trying to say is that that's the path of life they're trying to get at. I mean, hopefully Cecil won't end up being, you know, I don't know, IT help desk or director of technology for the the next administration or something. Uh, But I do think that it was kind of nice to see Amorosa on this show. I, I, like most people, was like, what the fuck? But then also I always think about this um, when Bethany Frankel was had her dumb reality TV show, or, or not her reality, her talk show. I remember that Amorosa was on her show and there was like a they did like a bet or something I don't remember what it was but it was some sort of bet and at the end of the day like Bethany was supposed to pay up or something and Bethany was so confident in her mediocrity that she was correct which you know is kind of Bethany's brand from her deli meats to her dumb jeans but like she was so confident and Amorosa kind of just like put her in her place and the entire audience was like very much on Bethany's side, but it was just so thrilling to watch Amorosa put Bethany in her place. Full disclosure, I will say, I remember watching that live when it was on. And I remember being a big Bethany fan at the time and being like, who the fuck does Amorosa think she is? And then like years later, where I, when I think I had a better understanding of the way that uh, black people are treated in media, and microaggressions. I rewatched that episode with Bethany. And at this point, I was like, so so on Bethany. I didn't hate her, but I was so so on it. And then I rewatched that episode of that that interview. And it was very obvious that Bethany, um, that Almarosa had a great point. That Almarosa, I think her whole point was about like the mediocrity that wh- white women come in with and how much harder black women have to work. And I just remember watching it the first time versus a couple of years later. I was very proud of myself for having that growth, but I was also cringing at myself for ever being like on Bethany's side. Like, what the fuck was I thinking? But, you know, hashtag evolution. Everybody can grow. Uh, which leads us to Contessa's intervention for Heavenly. Now, do I think that Heavenly is capable of any growth or healing? Guys, no. No. (laughs) Absolutely not. Heavenly is, I don't think that there's ever been a genuine moment of Heavenly on TV. Like, I think that Heavenly really thinks that she is like a full-fledged, like, comedian. And I think the only time I've ever, we've ever seen anything genuine or real with Heavenly has been when we, they, um, I think Jackie, Simone, and Heavenly go to Miami and they see, they visit the home that Heavenly grew up in. I think that's the only time we've ever seen Heavenly be a real person. But otherwise, she is always just doing shit for camera. 
Like, I don't – like, even this whole thing of, like, oh, these women better not try to fuck daddy. Like, last episode with during that, like, fashion show, she was, like, asking a girl to drop it down low right in front of her husband and then was, like, oh, bitch, you better not drop it in front of my husband. So it's, like, very obvious that, like, when the cameras are on, Heavenly is just playing to the cameras. So I think that she so much thinks of herself as like a, a reality TV personality. Like I think that she just doesn't – she doesn't take the show as seriously as I think anybody else does. And I, I think she really views it as like a a silly sitcom. And and I think what's complicated is that like these are real – in a reality TV show, you have real people with real feelings that get hurt. Now what I will say is that um, Contessa – while you are absolutely um you're absolutely allowed to feel the feelings that you feel i think contessa maybe is taking it too seriously um but they do this intervention and she's got the storm from x men wig on it's ridiculous and she assigns toya to be the person who's going to open the door and ask everybody to put their phones in what was that contraption was it a was it a a container to uh like a takeaway container for a container for a bunt cake. What was that? Was it a salad, like one of those salad dryers? I wanted to call it a salad tosser, but that's not what it is. One of those like, yeah, like salad drying things, contraptions. My brain's not working. Or was it a, I think it was a travel kit for like a travel case for a bunt cake for a very specific kind of cake. But anyway, they had Toya putting those phones in and Toya's, Toya's just – Toya's bad at peopling. Let's be honest. She's bad at peopling, okay? Um, she almost drives away Anila. She almost drives away Jackie. It's a whole thing. But everybody gets there and everybody has their phones collected. Um, and <laughs> – this is the best intervention I've ever seen. There's notebooks and pens, wings, and crown royal. Royal or royale. I don't know what it is, but it's great. It's for the intervention. And Contessa's approaching this, like, addiction management. And the thing is, Contessa, while you might have a point that Heavenly is addicted to the attention that she gets, you're also having her addiction intervention. Her, You're, at all, you're having her intervention about her being addicted to attention while she's on a TV show that enables her addiction to attention. Do you know what I mean? It's like if you were on a TV show called um, Project Crackway and you were addicted to Coke. I don't know. Is Coke and crack this? Oh, let's start this. Let's start this analogy over. Let's say you're on a TV show called Top Coke. And it's the competition is who is the biggest cokehead. And then you do an intervention on that show and you say, I think you might have a, an addiction to coke. It's like that. What, why would you hold an intervention to her addiction to a, like, why would you why would you do this? Why? It doesn't make any sense, except for the fact that it is fucking hilarious. Is it effective? Absolutely not. Is it entertaining? <laughs> Yes. Yes. It is so entertaining. Heavenly comes down there and they play Heavenly's greatest hits. And the hits are only for Heavenly. Okay. Heavenly is cracking up. She thinks she's amazing. Now, I think does Heavenly feel that she was ambushed and made to feel stupid? Yes. But what does she do? She does her Heavenly thing, which is she laughs at it. My favorite part of it was that Quad is like seriously writing down notes. Like she is at, you know, like, she is attending history lecture 101 or whatever that is. Like she is fully in college. <laughs> Heavenly thinks it's hilarious. It's just so funny. So is it effective? No, it's not effective. Is it entertaining? Yes. But to the question of is Heavenly wrong for using her using her coworkers as a way to make money on her YouTube Yes, it's wrong, but guess what? Everybody does it. I'm not saying just because everyone does it, it makes it okay, but like Tamara does it. All these, all, like the the green-eyed bandits do it, right? Like um, Robin and Giselle both have a podcast and now they're going to get to sit on their podcast while the show is 
on, which by the way, when is the show on? When is Potomac back? What the hell? It's supposed to be back in August. It started in August last year. What are we waiting for? Where is the trailer? Where is your scooter? I need to know. Anyway, Giselle and Robin are going to get to get sit on a platform and talk about their coworkers and talk about the storylines and give their side of the the truth or whatever. It's the exact same thing that Heavenly is doing. Is she doing? She's using the content on the show to recap and talk about on her YouTube channel. Yes, for clicks and likes and clout. Yes, it is annoying Contessa for her to do that. But at the same time, Heavenly's not wrong in saying that you talked about this on the show. I mean, we had this exact same thing happen when, was it a couple of seasons ago, where like Heavenly and Cecil got into a fight on Twitter and then Simone got really mad and she was like super duper pissed off at Heavenly. Like we've seen this fight before. It's just that Contessa's version of this fight is cuckoo banuno. Um, but again, VV entertaining, very silly, so ridiculous. Back to the question, is Heavenly going to do anything? Like, they all keep saying it. Heavenly's just going to do her Heavenly apology, and then that's it. That's all she does. There's not much else that you're going to get out of Heavenly. <sighs> but again, very entertaining. Um, let's go over to Real Houses of Atlanta, which is – actually so entertaining that I have like four lines of notes okay the fact that this episode was like half of it was spent on the driveway is incredible the fact that so much happened from like 9 a.m to presumably what like 3 p.m I mean Real Houses of Beverly Hills wishes wishes okay we, sh- we opened up the episode with everybody, a lot of iPhone footage, and then Marlo saying to the girls the night before, um, you know, if Kenya doesn't come and stay with us, then I'm going to, you know, then she's not allowed to come back. She better show up in the morning. If she's not here, then she's not allowed to hang out with us at all, which is you're not allowed to do that. I'm pretty sure, Marlo, like that's ridiculous, but Kenya does show up. She she scurries in at 9 a.m. She goes around. And she's bringing a lot of very fun energy. She's like, guys, I'm ready to dance. I'm ready to have fun. She's so happy. She's 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 happy and everybody is happy to see Kenya, which is what drives Marlo insane. So Marlo is like acting like, you know, your mom when you come home and you're trying to avoid her. And she's like, I just like to have a word with you. Can I get a word with you, Kenya? I'd like to have a – can we just have a one-on-one? If you don't mind, just come in and talk to me. Kenya doesn't want to talk to you. And then for you to be like – for Marla to be like, well, why are you here? This trip is so that everybody could support me. No, this trip is here because Bravo is paying for it and you guys are filming a television show. I'm so sick of this shit of like, I planned this trip so I could feel better. First of all, all these trips that they do are pre-planned. They're pre-planned trips. So for Marlo to be like, I needed to have this trip because I had kicked my nephews out is bullshit. The trip was already pre-planned. They had art, or maybe it wasn't. Maybe it wasn't, which is why they had this bizarro gem mining <laughs> activity. <laughs> gem minding. Gym minding is when I um, mind my business and don't go to the gym. But anyway, Marlo is like, she's she's really acting like, she has some authority over who could be there and it's annoying, but I appreciate the level of petty Kenya is, you know, Kenya, (laughs) this was like a physical embodiment of Kenya, (laughs) Kenya and her blow horn (laughs) asking Portia if she could spell scepter (laughs) at the reunion. I like, was it her first reunion or second reunion? I don't remember. Uh. That's this is the physical embodiment of that. Okay. She's just going around being funny, having a great time. And she knows that the happier she is, the angrier Marlo gets. And I appreciate that. It's like just because you're a sourpuss doesn't mean that I'm gonna be a sourpuss. And Marlo's on the phone with like her uh manager or whatever, and she's like, her manager's like, if she wants to be a sourpuss, she doesn't have to stay there. She's actually Kenya's being anything but a sourpuss. The only person being a sourpuss 
is Marlo at this point. There's other sourpusses later on. But Marlo and Kenya, the issue there is that Marlo just doesn't like that Kenya is happy and everybody's happy to see her. And then Sonia sitting Kenya down and being like, oh, like I want to resolve this. I get what Kenya is saying. I don't think there's anything wrong with what she was saying, which is why would I sit and try to be friendly with somebody who has been, one, reckless with her words with me in the past, and two, doesn't even give a shit about her own family, why the fuck do you think I would try to be her friend? I don't think Kenya's wrong in saying what she said because it's the damn truth. Now, here's the thing. Marlo is going around telling everybody about this thing with her nephews, right? Once you start telling people about the thing that you did that you know personally was probably not a good idea because we've seen multiple episodes of her saying to the women, is this a good idea? Are you, is this bad? Am I messing them up? She's obviously nervous about it, but it's like, and I get that Kenya was being bitchy, but like Marlo, if you don't want people talking about this particular business, don't bring it up. Don't bring it up. But Kenya's not wrong in saying, why would I try to be her friend? When she's been vicious to me in the past, she has a history of being terrible to me, and she is so unhinged that she just threw her nephews out. Why would I? Why? Now, is Sonya meddling when she goes to Marlo with Sheree to do this? Absolutely. She's trying to secure her camera time. But I thought initially Marlo, I thought initially Sonya was like, you know, I think the way she was thinking about it was, I need to explain to Marlo why Kenya doesn't feel good about being her friend, right? And I think that what she thought was she was saying, like, you know, Kenya was thinking to herself, like, Kenya thinks, like, you know, why would I, how can I guarantee that she's going to be good to me when she's having all these other issues? I think maybe that's what Sonia was trying to say. But overall, I mean, she looked like a mess. She looked like an idiot. Like, Sonia looked like a straight up jackass this episode. Straight up, like a dumb, dumb little jackass. Um, But what gets hilarious is that when they all finally decide to go outside, Marlo is literally chasing Kenya and Kenya is literally running away. Again, it's it's her using a blowhorn to ask Portia, can you spell scepter? Is that the word she asked her to spell? I think so, right? Yeah. That's what it was. It was petty and it was ridiculous, but it was also hilarious. And I truly don't understand. I do not understand Marlo's obsession with Kenya. The only thing I can pick up from Marlo's obsession with Kenya is that she wants to be like her. She wants to be liked like her. She wants to be her friend. But there's there's this thing that uh, we do as human beings. It's called self-sabotage. And the reason why we do it is because in our brain sometimes it feels safer to stay in mess. Because when you grow up in chaos, um, it sometimes feels safer to embrace the chaos rather than accepting something good in front of us. So – if you're, if you, let's say, have been in multiple relationships and you have a really good one, everything's going really well, you find yourself self sabotaging, it is because your brain is protecting itself from experiencing a new thing that might be good for you. It is always more comfortable to fall back into. Uh, into chaos because that's what it knows. The unknown is always the scariest thing for your brain. And I feel like that's what Marlo is doing. But I also think it's because Marlo is an asshole. Let's be real. Marlo is an asshole. But they get into this big fight on the driveway. Kenya says things about Marlo's kids, Marlo's nephews. And apparently, according to uh, this clip I saw of Candy and Crazy Ass Fatum talking on uh, Candy's YouTube, which, by the way, nobody's coming at Candy for her YouTube channel there. She has a YouTube channel called Speak On It. She does it all season long. If she can do it, so can Heavenly. Who cares? Anyway, um, Candy's talking about that, talking on there, and apparently Marlo said horrible things about Brooklyn. And even if Marlo didn't say it there, we know Marlo has said horrible things about Brooklyn. Marlo has insinuated that Kenya didn't give birth to Brooklyn. She's insinuated that those aren't Kenya that that Brooklyn isn't Kenya's, that she had to use somebody else's egg. It's so fucked up. 
Marlo is an asshole and she's done absolutely nothing to deserve Kenya's friendship or Kenya's respect. But Kenya, the the worst thing she did was run away from Marlo and not want to talk to her. But the rest of the episode, she's minding her damn business. She's not saying anything. She's not doing anything. She's actually minding her business. But at, at the, after some trampolining and all of that, um, these women decide, oh, before the trampolining, apparently Fatum and Drew get into it. I don't know what's going on there. I think the only thing that I can pick up is that Drew can't be around Fatum because Fatum's going to spill Drew's secrets. <laughs> Because Fatuma is crazy in her eyes. That lady comes uh, a little inebriated, a little glazed up, ready to produce, and she doesn't care. <laughs> she doesn't care what comes out of her mouth. I'll talk about Fatuma later. That was another hilarious part of the speak on it from Fatuma that <laughs> Ugh, I'll get to it. Anyway, after some trampolining, they all get their energy out and they go several hours away to this gem mining. It is rough. <laughs> it is rough. It's not, it's so, it's not even white refrigerator ghetto, okay? It's at, it's, it's icebox and outhouse ghetto, okay? That's the kind of event this is. It's horrible. And I'm glad that Kenya took down that dumbass Trump 2024 sign. That man was clearly uncomfortable with those women being there. And then like the end, Marlo's like apologizing to this weird ass Trumper for the women. Well, Marlo, why are you apologizing in that way, man? Is that a possible future clientele that you're looking at of the old dudes that you date? I don't know. But don't. Do not apologize to that man. Um... Yeah, I think that's where they're doing this weird gem mining stuff and Drew, Fatum tries to sit down next to Drew and he she just freaks out. She walks away and it's weird. It's really weird. And this is where Drew gets into this arf arf dog stuff. <laughs> so much, so much on the dog stuff. It's bizarre. They get back to the house and Marlo does a classic real world house meeting. Okay, <laughs> shout out to Marlo for paying homage to the best thing that came out of the real world, which is house meetings. And um, she tells the women she wants to go home. Uh, But then she says she's going to send them home. And she says it's because she's exhausted. She says she doesn't feel supported. She keeps saying, I didn't have a support system. Someone else came and it became about them. It wasn't about me. Yeah, it's because Kenya's there. Marla's just mad because Kenya is there. That's all it is. She's just pissed off that Kenya is there and everybody's having a great time with Kenya. And because it's like, and because Marlo doesn't get to have that fun. Marlo doesn't get to have fun with Kenya. Everybody else is having fun with Kenya. And now Marlo is pissed about it. That's all it's about. That's all it is. And in the midst of all this, Fatum and Drew start going at it, and Drew pulls out a dog bone and throws it at Fatum. And everybody's like, where did you get, like, why is Drew, where is the, what, how much, like, look, I can't even get my question out. Why the dog bone? Where did you get it from? I have a feeling she bought it at that stupid um, gem mining place. It had to have been there. If she didn't, she just brought it for fun. Because she started coming in hard with this lapdog stuff. And I feel like Sheree is going to be like, I mean, we saw the preview next week. Sheree is going to come at Drew for this. But this whole lapdog, she's your lapdog, arf, arf, here's a bone. It's, it's so ridiculous. It is so ridiculous. It is as ridiculous as her bringing her headshot to the last trip. It's bizarre. Drew <laughs> Drew does unintentional prop comedy, and it's very funny. I don't think she means for it to be funny, but it is hilarious. She really thinks she tried something and did something. <laughs> it never works out for her. And again, the best part of this fight with Drew versus Fatum, Fatum is everybody's just laughing and how ridiculous it is. Because Fatum is nuts, and Drew is delusional. And it, together, it's just, it's so funny. Um so on the speak on it, apparently Fatum was pissed about this, but she told the story about how she took Drew's purse 
and took it to Sheree's room to go through it and see what's inside. And then she's telling the story to Candy. And she's like, and you know, editors seem to take that out, which was ridiculous. I thought it was hilarious that I did that. I thought it was so funny watching Drew walk around the house, look for her stuff. But they seemed to take that out. But instead, they kept this dog thing. And I think what Fatum thought was like, oh, editors decided to keep me getting insulted, but they didn't put in anything about how I retaliated by stealing Drew's stuff. <laughs> Fatum! Fatum is insane! <laughs> I haven't seen a person, I haven't seen a friend of this crazy since Kim G on <laughs> Rosses of New Jersey, okay? <laughs> With your fake square tits. <laughs> Jeez. Fatum is nuts! And she told the whole story, and she was so incensed by the fact that editors did cut out that whole thing. <laughs> and Candy was like, why would you want to put that in the show? <laughs> what? And then I guess after that, they stopped letting her come on, and it's because Drew took it all the way to the top and told them that she felt unsafe around this woman. Let's be honest. Again, Drew feels unsafe around this woman because this crazy ass woman is going to pay like the $150 fee you can <laughs> annual fee you can pay to have that you know go on one of those background check websites and get all the information about Drew and Ralph that's what it is let's be honest let's call a spade a spade let's call a crazy a crazy let's call a grift a grift okay <sighs> what a fun show what a fun two uh shows back to back uh thank you all for being here uh, that's it for this episode. Next episode will be Real Houses of Beverly Hills and uh, Real Houses of Dubai. And I will catch you there. Thank you for listening. Bye. The reality is, is now on Patreon, and here are some of our fabulous supporters. Chastity Davis. Don't be fooled by my name. The only thing I abstain from is your bullshit. Jessica Riley. Where I come from, money can buy you anything, but I'll take the garbage plate. Seiran Hayati. In Sweden, we have ABBA, IKEA, and if you mess with me, some other four-letter words. Kelly Payfer. I may be from down under, but don't ever underestimate me. Richie D. If you can't be cool, you can't be with Caduce. Megan Shaw. I may be a mod but I'll never be your model minority. Becca Simon. It gets icy where I'm from, so you know I'll bring the heat. Jill Hirsch. Your petty drama can't take this warrior down. Jamie Allrunner. Where I come from, we're known for our great lakes, but I'm just known for my great ass. Sarah Gibbs. You may not like the cut of my jib, but that's what you get from Sarah Gibbs. Maria M. Where I'm from, they sing God Save the Queen, so I guess you can call me a god. Jill Walsh. I made it up this hill myself, and I'll kick any jack off. Jesse Willis. I may not run in traffic, but I'll give you a run for your money. Eleanor Manning. I run with a fabulous circle of people, and they're not even on my payroll. John Friedman. Diamonds aren't a girl's best friend. John Friedman is. Sarah Watskins Bilstein. Playtime is over. This mama means business. Laura Zielinski. Whether it's breast pumping or fist pumping, this Jersey girl brings the party. Amanda Agosti. Everything is bigger in Texas and my heart is no exception. Tracy Masters. When you're the master of your own destiny, no one can ever take you down. Marl Farsi. Reading is fundamental and in Farsi, the reads are monumental. Tracy Newman. My presence is a gift, so remember the thank you note. Lola Del Rio. Whatever Lola wants, Lola gets and I get it all. Ade Adedoko. It may look like I'm stirring the pot, but I'm actually just smoking. Deepa Kanapoli. Some people say I have secrets, but at least they're not federal indictments. Jada. People are intimidated by my great success and my great ass. Naveen Jonathan. I'll give you the shirt off my back and also my unsolicited opinion. Hadil Ibrahim. Some things are too hot to handle, like me and the tea I spill. Trinity Subramaniam. I have four degrees and eight syllables and zero fucks to give. Beth Bayer. The secret to my success is staying out of your BS. Shannon Anthony. There's no fun in moderation, but there's plenty of shame. Rita Ryan. Don't be fooled by my Midwest charm, because I'm nobody's fool. Brianna Tony. Some people strive for perfection, but I'm already there. And lastly, Tanisha. While others are turning tables, I'm dancing on them.